Welcome to Simple Science. Today we're going to be talking about tyres. And there's a lot of talk about tyres on a Grand Prix weekend. The drivers, the strategists and of course the commentators are giving us loads of different terms that we may not understand. So here to demystify some of those and give us some more information as, as simply as possible is Loic Serra, the Performance Director for the Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team. Loic, thanks for joining me. Hello. So Loic, the first question I have is a simple one, and that's what is an F1 tyre made from? An F1 tyre is made of, um, or made from rubber and plies of course. So you've got these two, um, two main consistent all around the tyre. People think there is not much else than rubber in the tyre, but actually you've got plenty of plied coils in, inside the tyre. And if you didn't, uh, you would not have any uh, stru structural strength of the tyre. You know, if you, if you take the example of, a, of an inner tube and you inflate an inner tube, it has no structural strength. You know, you inflate, it will go, keep going bigger and bigger until it explodes. But, but it's, it has no strength. So you need these cords inside the tire to give the structural strength. So what you have, you have all these cords, you've got embedded into rubber, and the rubber there, it allows to seal the air that you're gonna inflate the tire with. And this, when you pressurize your tire, all the cords will go into tension, and then you achieve you know, the shape you want because the tire is not like a ring. If you look at this tire, for example, is not its profile. Its, very, uh, its, its profile is very flat. It's nowhere near a ring. So if you if you inflate an inner tube, you will see it just go bigger and it goes circular. It's got a ring, but you don't have the flat surface or the flat profile you want from a racing tire or from a tire in general to maximize your grip. That's why you've got these cords and that's why you've got the rubber around to seal the air you're going to inflate it with. And then you've got at the top what we call the compound, uh, which is. Nothing else than two or three millimeters of a rubber, but this rubber is the key bit for grip. And that's where there's a lot of science. I mean, there's a lot of science going into the tire structure for sure, but the compound is one of the key um, grip generator, I should say. There's still quite a lot going on in terms of development, year after year from Pirelli, in order to just improve, improve this compound on that structure. It's already more complex than I would have imagined. Um, so at least on to my next question, which is why a tyre is so important in Formula One? It's a key aspect of the car performance itself. If you want to generate these forces, and when we talk about a car pulling 5Gs in a corner or 6Gs in braking, basically talking about generating forces or applying forces to the car because these Gs are only achievable with forces coming from somewhere. So we heard Mike uh, in uh, talking about forces applied by the air on the car via aerodynamic, but you've got all the forces applied from the tarmac to the tires, and that's just going through the tires, and that's just going through the contact patch itself. This is why they're so important, is because if you can't generate these forces, or if you can't maximize these forces, you just won't have performance. The other reason why they are key is because you look at these tires, etc., and they look nice and shiny, but they're changing all the time. They're living things, you know. They're they're very, very difficult to, uh, to keep under control and a bit of a moving target for us. It needs management from the drivers, it needs management from the race engineers on the setup side, etc. That's also why there's so much of a talking point. It's because they vary all the time, you just need to find a solution to maximize the performance as time goes on. Even when weather change, the performance is going to change a lot. And worse than that, you know, when you test on Friday, and you think you've understood how your setup should be, you've understood how they work, etc. Oh, wow, but okay, you have a nice light time on Friday. It doesn't mean you're gonna be good on Sunday because the weather may change on Sunday and you may find yourself in a, in, in a, in a massive pain performance-wise just because you haven't anticipated well enough the, uh, uh, the impact of temperature or weather um, on, on your tire performance. How much exactly is there in terms of the, the performance part of the tyre. Um, what are we talking in terms of the actual tread depth? Not much. You say you've got two or three millimetres of rubber, but these two or three millimetres of rubber are a key part of the performance. Why exactly are tyres so important in Formula One? Why do we talk about them so much? The forces that are generated you know, between the car and the track, they are going through the tyres basically. Most of them, or a big part of them at least, are going through the tyres. It just rely on these four contact point that are just what we call the contact patch. Uh, the four contact patch, sometimes three when you've got one wheel in the air. 
these points of contact are the one where forces applied to the car by the truck are going through. In that respect, another question, would, would it be fair to say that like, getting the tyres working well is, more, is, is one of the most important things on the weekend, like more important than bringing, say, a, a small upgrade to the aero? It's a very important part of, of the performance. And, you know, and uh, when you ask you know, why they are so important, is also because they're a bit of a living thing. You know, they are, um, they are extremely difficult to keep under control. And they're just uh, um, a, a small change in temperature, a small change in pressure, and you've got a different behavior. So, so that's, that's what makes them really compli complicated to handle. And that's why we always talk about them, because it's not like, you know, you've got something you've understood on Friday and it's there, you don't have to change anything. They're just a living product. Over um, a race, let's say, or certainly through, through the longer runs in practice. What exactly is it that's causing the tyre to degrade? Degradation is a word that we hear thrown around all the time by teams and by commentators. What exactly causes that tyre to degrade? The main contributors to degradations are for the tyres, so they are the wear, temperature, or I should say temperatures, I'll say, because there's different uh, parts of the tyres and different temperature um, you know, if you talk about the tire surface temperature or you talk about the bulk temperature, they have different contribution to degradation and also pressure. Pressure is also a key contributor to tire degradation. Basically, these, these three things, so wear, temperature and pressure. If you want to understand why these three factors contribute to degradation, it's because so if, you look, if you look at temperature, for example, and then we talked about these two types of temperature, bulk temperature and surface temperature, rubber is extremely sensitive to, uh, to temperature. So if you take a piece of rubber and um, you look at its characteristic with, you know, across uh, varying temperature, so a cold rubber will be reasonably steep and the hotter the rubber gets, uh, the softer it gets. So, um, and then, then at one stage, uh, it becomes so soft and so fragile that it breaks. So, so, you know, when you change the temperature, you will change the way um, um, you, would, you, you will affect the wear, but you will also affect the grip characteristic of the rubber itself. So that's why you are running, the temperature of the tire is changing and that's affecting the degradation. You've got similar effect of temperature on pressure. So when you run, most of the time, you know, a temperature build up, the pressure is also increasing and that also reduces the grip. So this is how the temperature is affecting the pressure, which affects the degradation. We also, um hear them talking a lot about blistering and graining and it, it'd be great to get some clearer pictures of, of exactly what that is. So we talked about you know the, the wear as being an element of degradation as you rightly said there are different type of ways of damaging in a way the, the rubber that is the, the compound uh, rubber and you talked about blistering we also have sometimes we hear about graining or just abrasion, or which is the normal wear. If you look at the abrasion, it's just tire generated forces uh, on the track. In order to generate it, these forces, it needs to slide a little bit, and sometimes a lot, and sometimes a bit. And just by sliding this rubber on a tarmac, which is basically stones and, and, and tar, you can imagine that you know you've got this soft material sliding on a, on stones, and then you will for sure peel bits of rubber, uh, uh, more or less uh, depending on the tarmac and more or less depending on how much sliding you, you generate. So the normal usual wear that is called abrasion is just us peeling bits of rubber by, by sliding this tire on the tarmac, removing rubber minute after minute or laps after laps. So that's for the normal abrasion. And then actually when we've got normal or, or abrasion, we're reasonably happy because uh, we've got to do the, a gentle uh, degradation which you can't really stop because you won't be able to generate these forces without having this wear anyway. Then you've got other type of degradation, say wear, that are a bit more annoying. So blistering is one of them. So blistering is within these two or three millimeters of rubber that you have to work with. When the temperature go beyond a certain level, above 150 degrees, the rubber at one stage will just boil. It goes from this viscoelastic material to um, just uh, liquid and, and it just vaporized. So um, it, will, it will boil and then you start seeing these bubbles appearing on the, on, at the surface of the tire. But, but what it means is that the rubber has gone. So if it's, you know, depending on where the blistering is happening across the tire section, 
it is more or less of a or it has more or less of a consequence on performance and sometimes it's just you know you see it is quite it's quite uh, spectacular but he actually has very little consequences on performance sometimes it's just a tiny bit but in the wrong place of the tire and then it has massive consequences on on the on the tire grip so that that is for the blistering one of the other one that we hear a lot about is the graining the graining is a very rapid uh, degradation graining you can run out of tires in say five ten laps uh, so and and it's really impressive that you you are properly losing big bits of the compound in every single corner what's happening in graining is you know we were saying earlier that the rubber is is very sensitive to temperature and we say okay when it goes very hot then you've got the blistering and it's just you've got this the rubber boiling when you have when the rubber is operating is in, in in its uh, uh, temperature window you've got you know in in this optimum temperature window you've got the usual the normal abrasion i would say but then when the rubber is on the cold side um then you've got grading rubber turn into glass actually and then turn and it will break like glass so rubber in across temperature range will go from glass to uh, just boiling and then and we are actually seeing all these mechanisms all these effects uh, on track during the season how can we look out for those as fans watching on tv what does blistering look like and um, when we're seeing those close-up shots while the cars are moving so fast and what does what does graining look like to the naked eye when you see the cars on tv when you've got blistering you would see a dark line all around the tire in the middle or on the side depending on the tire if it's in the middle actually it's a uh, it's quite bad news uh, uh it means you 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 start to lose quite a lot of quite quite a lot of grip if it's on the side it, or on the edge of the tire it's less it has less of a consequence on the performance to see the graining on tv it's quite difficult graining or heavy abrasion if you really have to look at the tires very closely to see the difference and actually even if when you see you look at the tire closely it's it is difficult uh, to uh, identify if it's heavy abrasion or if it's graining and but it's key to understand because if you if you do the wrong diagnostic of the wear or degradation mechanism that you have you will definitely apply the wrong uh, recipe to or the wrong me medicine to it and you'll be in deep troubles come the weekend so 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 it's not something you would easily spot on tv and actually i'd say it's also not something we would always get right and and, and it does create a bit of confusion there of course, degradation uh, and, and different levels of wear can lead to some interesting strategy calls. I remember uh, being in uh, Hungary last year and we made a call to bring Lewis in for an extra stop and then he hunted down Max Verstappen for, I think it was about 18 laps and, and eventually won the race. Um, yeah, can you t do you remember exactly what was happening there? Well, I remember that uh, our strategies did a great job there. It's really about that. So, you know, we, we talk about degradation, and degradation is unavoidable. You, ho you always have degradation. The problem is not really degradation itself. It's usual degradation, and start from lap one or two, because the grip of the tire, you've got it from a brand new tires. So in qualifying, for example, you've got your big grip after, you know, lap one or lap two, and that's it. And, uh, and from there onward, the tire is just uh, degrades and start wearing out. So the degradation itself is not the issue. It's more, you know, when are you going to run out of rubber? And in Hungary, we did a better job than the opposition there to predict, you know, when are we going to run out of rubber and then to be able to inject fresh rubber when needed, because then you can push it. Whereas the other car actually to leave what we had, but it wasn't in deep trouble because he had gone down so much of rubber that now it's not the gentle degradation that you have. You're losing several tenths, even seconds a lap when this happened. Throughout the season, Pirelli provide five different uh, slick compounds, dry weather compounds, of which we can take three to each race. Why do we have different compounds at different circuits? The main reason for, uh, to have a different compounds at the different uh, circuits are the first one is the duty cycle. If you go to Silverstone, for example, with all these high speed corners, you can imagine that a car pulling 5Gs in the corners for more than two or three consecutive seconds. We will be a huge amount of energy going through the tires. You can also Imagine that a very soft compound that won't live very long is just uh, too soft to survive to this duty cycle. In comparison, you go to Monaco. Monaco is there's loads of low-speed corners 
where uh, duty cycle is lower and then you can afford a softer compound. Having said that, we ran out of front tires in, in Monaco last year. The duty cycle will dictate the compound stiffness that you can bring or how aggressive you can be with compound from one track to the other. So that's one thing. And the other one is the tarmac. I mean, as we, as we alluded to a bit earlier, you've got multiple type of tarmacs along the season and they all have different impact on the tire and the way they work the rubber. So you can easily imagine that, you know, if you have a very rough tarmac with stones like proper spikes, if you go there with a soft compound, these stones are going to break the rubber in no time. And sometimes you've got just these stones on top of the tarmac that are quite polished, not as abrasive. On this tarmac, normally you can go a bit softer without damaging the, the rubber too much. Tarmac will be another reason you need to different compounds. Then you've got the weather. Uh, we talked a bit earlier about graining, for example. So if you go to a place where you expect cold conditions, you're more susceptible to graining. And again, in these conditions, a soft compound will struggle a lot more than a, than, than a stiff compound. So places where you expect colder conditions, you want, you want to be less aggressive with rubber to avoid this graining. And, and, and finally, you've got the strategy aspect you talked about, where, you know, for the show itself, um, it's sometimes quite interesting to bring more aggressive compounds or less aggressive compounds, challenge a bit the strategists and the teams. You mentioned there one of the aspects being the, the surface. Um, of course, some of the tracks that we know so well get resurfaced. Uh, Silverstone, to name but one, has been resurfaced in the last few years. H how does that change your preparation and how much more important does that make the uh, FP1 and FP2? When you change tarmac, you never really know what to expect. We're doing lots of measurement and teams are doing lots of measurement in general to try to understand, but I don't think any of us understand exactly how it works. I think we are understanding a bit better than yesterday, but we're still miles away from understanding very well. So it's, it's always a big challenge. And we sort of, you know, have a look to what's there on Thursday, Wednesday, but, but really until you run on Friday, you don't really know what to expect. Tarmac, unfortunately, is not a fixed thing. It's not something that has got a specification and won't change. You run on it, and it's a bit like the tire. It's also wearing out, and it's also changing its characteristics. So a brand new tarmac doesn't, doesn't stay new for very long. And then during the weekend itself, you are seeing evolution of the tarmac itself, which again, and something that needs to be not really anticipated will be, uh, be good if we could anticipate it, but at least taken into account. One of the ways um, that you manage the tires over the weekend is by, by heating them. We have electric tire uh, heating blankets they heat the tires throughout the weekend. Why exactly do we heat the tires? I think we touched a little bit earlier on the fact that the rubber is super sensitive to temperature. A Formula One car has got a huge duty cycle compared to our passenger cars. So because of, of this high duty cycle, we do stabilize the, the rubber at high temperature. Let's say we stabilize around 100 to 120 degrees of bulk temperature when running. Unfortunately, it's, it's almost impossible to develop a rubber that has got good grip you know, from 20 degrees to say 150 degrees. It's not the way rubber works. And, and as a lot of, you know, the tire manufacturer period is for sure working hard on trying to increase or improve the operating window of the tire. There's so much that can be achieved at the moment. If you want a tire that is high performing tire for high duty cycle, you need a tire um, that has got a rubber that operates well around the 100 degrees temperature. This is not the temperature we've got in the air. You know, when you go to a track, you've got, say, between 15 and 30 degrees. Nowhere near the 100 degrees you need. So, and if you were to leave the blanket like this, you know, um, mounted outside the garage, uh, just uh, submitted to, the, to the, the, uh, the, the air temperature, you'll start your lap with a tire at 20 degrees. And the rubber will be so steep that you will not generate any grip. And actually, I think you, 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 the, the driver will be likely to crash with a tire like that, even in the pit lane. So, so because there won't be any grip. Um, so that is one reason. And the other reason is, as we said before, if you were to start running at 20 degrees and then you stabilize at 100 degrees with, with your tire, what would happen at the same time is pressure inside the, or the air inside the tire cavity will go from 20 degrees to 100 degrees also, because while the rubber is heating, the air inside the, the tire cavity is also heating. But then you will, the pressure will rise massively. And then you'll, you'll find yourself you know, with another 10 PSI, 15 PSI, which we know 
is not what you want for performance. So basically by heating the rubber or putting the tires in blanket, you achieve two things. You artificially put your tires closer to their stabilized operating condition, which allow you to be close to your 80 to 100 degrees or more. And then the pressure also closer to the stabilized pressure you want. So having a tire which actually won't, uh, where the, the pressure won't vary too much while running. We know that we can heat the fronts up to 100 degrees Celsius, the rears up to 80 degrees Celsius under the current right. regulations. But how hot then can the tires actually get around the track? Certainly you've mentioned that high speed corners and abrasive surfaces are one of the, the things that really sort of get energy into the tires. How, how hot can these Pirelli tires actually get? You can get to 100, 150 degrees or more. And then there's a stage where you start seeing the bubbles up, uh, uh, appearing as, as we talked about uh, earlier. You know, that's the, then, then you get into blistering area. You can get to 150 degrees. That's not what you want. Because when we were talking about rubber being optimum around 100, 100 plus degrees, now if you go close to 150 degrees, you start losing performance. Not even talking about blistering. You do lose performance. Throughout a race, what sort of heat shift are we seeing between uh, the cars at their coolest, maybe on a long straight, versus in a, in a high-speed corner? So you've got two distinct things. You've got the bulk temperature, which is not something that changed that quickly. It's not like something that changed corner by corner. Well, or it does, but, but it's, it's very, it's very, uh, it's more something that is varying from one lap to another lap. Say, for example, you've got safety car in. Your tires are going to go down in terms of block temperature quite a lot because, you know, you're clearly going slow, slowly. You often hear the drivers complaining about the fact that the safety car is too slow. If you were to be in the safety car, you would not say it's slow. It's just, it's a very slow duty cycle compared to what the F1 car can do. And then it brings the temperatures going down and you lose a lot of grips. So that's also why you're seeing the drivers. You're moving the car or weaving the car, trying to keep some temperature in the tire as much as they can to bring it closer to where it's optimum because that's what they will need when they restart. But they, will need, they won't be able to go to this optimum anyway because there's no way you can achieve the same duty cycle behind a, behind a safety car, even if you're weaving. So, um, so you can go as low as say 70 degrees there and then you restart and then in three laps, you're already in, at 120 degrees. For the surface temperature, it's a bit different. Surface temperature is something that is a lot more dynamic than the bulk temperature. But it's understandable because the surface temperature is the bit of the tire that slides on the road. Sliding will create temperature immediately. If you take your hand and, and slide it on, on, on a rough surface, you'll feel the pain and you'll feel the, the burn uh, immediately. And that's actually what's happening on the, on the tire surface. So from the tire surface temperature will change by 40, 50 or more degrees just from the entry to the middle of the corner. <laughs> That's quite incredible. Um, just for a comparison, could you, could you tell me roughly um, how this compares with a road car? What sort of temperatures can you generate in a road car if you're driving quickly, but sensibly, of course? Uh, your road car tyre will go around, will go close to 50 degrees, this ballpark, maybe a tiny bit more, but that's what we're talking. Uh, we were saying, you know, that Formula One tyres can go to 150 or beyond. Wow, so no, nowhere near basically what a, a Formula One Pirelli tyre can generate. At the same time, you know, the grip level that you can uh, achieve with your uh, passenger car is nowhere near uh, what you have on, uh, on the Formula One tyre. So, and, uh, you know, the requirement in terms of wear are not the same. And it, on, the, on a racing tyre, we only have to do, say, 100 plus kilometres on your passenger car. I'm not sure you would be really happy if you if you, have to change, if you had to change them every 100 kilometers. Another term that we hear spoken about around tyres over a Grand Prix weekend uh, is marbles. Sometimes we get those low camera shots and, and, and sort of we can see the, the dirty side of the track, as well as they call it. What exactly are marbles? Where do they come from? When you slide the tyres, and when you have to generate this wear, these dead rubber is actually not going anywhere in the first place. So it stays on the tyre, glued to the rest of the rubber that is already on the tyre and it's moving around, you, you sometimes see it. You know, what people talk about, so it, it's really obvious when in some circumstances you can see like a, a line of rubber moving across the tire. Um, so, and that, that's an extreme case. But so these dead rubber are, um, stay on the tire, but until a point, so when you've got too much dead rubber accumulating on the surface of the tire, then at one stage in a straight line where you've got, you know, the, 
high speed, high centrifugal force when the tire is rotating very, very quickly, all the dead rubber that is sticking to the surface just want to go. And at one stage it would just go, uh, but it will go not as a very a thin particle. It will go as a, as a, you know, as a marble, which is several millimeters, centimeters bullet of rubber. You often see them in a straight line or close to high speed corners also where the speed and centrifugal force uh, on the tires is, is very high. Say on a straight, you're, you're trying to make an overtake. You, you have to go onto that dirty side of the, of the track and you're picking up mar marbles. How much is that affecting your grip going into the next or, or next few corners? It will affect it significantly. That's why, um, well, yeah, that's why you try to avoid it. So it's not always possible to avoid it, but yeah, it will, it will clearly have um, a negative consequence on the, on the grip. Another thing I want to talk about is, is tyre pressures. Um, they've changed a lot over the years in Formula One, and now we have uh, Pirelli set us minimum tyre pressures for the race weekend. Why are we trying to minimise the running pressure of the tyre? The reason why we try to minimise the running pressure of the tyre is because, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, these contact patch, which are the points, the only point of contact with the, with, with the tarmac or with the ground. Uh, where the forces are, where these in-plane forces are generated. And in order to maximize these forces, actually you want this contact patch surface to be as big as possible. If then it's quite easy to understand why you want to minimize your running pressure. Because the, um, the lower the running pressure, the bigger the contact patch. If I take this tire and I, uh, you know, I squeeze it with a certain force, if I deflate it, I mean the surface in contact will increase. And, and the grip, is um, the grip of the rubber is inverse proportional um, to the contact pressure. So you want this contact patch surface to be as big as to be as big as possible to maximize your grip. That's why. Up to a point, if you go too low in pressure, then then you know we were talking about um, the, the structure of the tire a bit earlier. Um, so and this structure is all together by the pressure because all these cords, you know, if you don't um, put them in tension with pressure inside the tire then then they are just like cords so they will be flexible and they won't they won't give any structural strength so if you if you go too low you don't maintain the structural integrity of the tire so you risk uh, well first of all you start losing grip and then you risk to break them because they're just not operating at um, uh, what's safe uh, structurally and that's why we have minimum pressure what's the first indication of when the tires are losing performance? The first thing is, 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 is the watch, because you know, you, um, you gotta go slower. So if you, when you start degrading or when you, when you lose grip, I mean, you go slower, as simple as that. So, and as we uh, mentioned a bit earlier, this is happening almost immediately. You know, first lap, second lap, you've got your, pit, or from a brand new tire, you've got big grip, and then the tires start degrading. So, you go slightly slower, and uh, so you sit on the watch. Then uh, you sit, or you, uh, no, you also sit on the car balance because it's not like you know degradation. You know, is wear of the tires or whatever mechanism we, uh, you know, we were talking about. But it's um, uh, it's the front axle, it's the rear axle, and it's not always at the same time. So so, at a, so you're not degrading axle at the same uh, at the same rate. Uh, that's an extremely difficult job for the racing jet to not only be able to set up the car to extract the best possible lap time on one lap with brand new tires and also make sure that these tires are going to degrade in a balanced manner front to rear axle to maintain as much performance as it can despite accepting the fact that they're going to degrade because wear is, is unavoidable wear is just a consequence of slowing as we talked earlier but there are ways of degrading that are less impactful on, on, on the performance. The race engineers have got this difficult task to make sure that the car can be fast on one lap, but also that the car is using the front and the rear axle in the most um, uh, balanced way to maintain competitiveness despite having this wear. So, so, but it's rarely the case that we can achieve the perfect balance of wear during a race stint for, for many reasons. Um, and what we notice is often um, we notice um, that the car balance is changing during the, during a stint. And so, if you lose more front end than rear end, you start 
seeing understeer, you start seeing the front locking in the braking areas and the car becomes more and more understeer. So meaning the car doesn't want to turn anymore. And so the driver has to slow down more just to allow the car to turn. That's when you are starting to lose more front grip than rear grip. And then places where you lose more rear than front, then you struggle with acceleration. You struggle to pick up the throttle out of the corner. And then you've got what we call oversteer, which is the rear, the, the rear just want to um, um, go in front of the front axle, which is not good. That's where you, you see these, the car, you know, it's very nice to see the car sliding. You, you see these big slip angles on the cars. Very nice, but very inefficient. It makes the car very slow. You often hear the, the drivers the driver complaining because uh, well they can feel the balance consequence they can also feel that they're losing grip overall and they don't like to see the the lap time uh, increasing so that you've mentioned the effects um of the tires losing performance on the driver but how can the, the driver and, and the driving style preserve the life of the tires it seems that some drivers have a style that means that they can run a longer stint whereas others uh, not so much so some drivers have got the ability to modify the way they use axle across the stint and also they got the ability to adjust whatever is adjustable on their side the brake balance etc in order to modify the way they use one axle compared to the other that is actually a very strong skill because it often makes a difference so one final question it's clear from everything that you've said today just how complex tire management is and how important tires are but it, it sounds like you know everything you need to know and you've got it all under control no we know very little uh we know very little about tires i think we know a lot more than we knew 10 years ago but it's still a big mystery um and, and actually that what make it fun um and that also what make it um what make it so imp- unpredictable you know you you're seeing all of us you know um um struggling with degradation on a given weekend uh, and if we knew everything <laughs> that would not happen so but 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 yeah we we miles away from uh from understanding um the tires very well um and if you think you understand it very well you have to <laughs> you have you have to uh, reconsider it because there's so much signs around there are uh, showing that we are nowhere near um, understanding it as, as well as we should. Loic, thank you so much for your time today. There's so much information there. You've certainly made uh, the picture of the importance of tyres and the complexity of tyre management much clearer in my mind and hopefully for some other people too. Thanks so much for your time today and uh, we'll see you when we go racing again. Thank you.